so much for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, my name is uh, Gishoya. I work at Emory University and uh, my, I'm, a, I'm a physician and I'm an interventional radiologist, which just means that we do minimally invasive surgeries using medical imaging. And I'm also very fortunate to work at the intersection of informatics, which is applying um, you know, computers and studying how they're used in clinical work. And so I'm very excited to talk about this topic about uh, fairness in medical algorithms. And I just have to encourage everyone, please use the chat to ask any questions. I'll be looking at that and uh, Vimal is gonna be helping me monitor that. And um, just because this, this is such a tough topic, there are no answers, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to disappoint some of you there, but I can just tell you maybe what the scope is and what needs to be done, and hopefully maybe challenge you to bring your expertise to solve this uh, problem. And so uh, these are my disclosures. Nothing is going to bias this talk. I have some funding that I use for research, and I also work on some committees in radiology, uh, you know, doing advocacy around AI education. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I am Kenyan, as you may be able to tell from my accent. Um, I went to medical school in Kenya. And, you know, at that time, I was still struggling through uh, a pandemic, and that was the HIV pandemic. And, you know, what that meant was we had to figure out how are we going to organize the data to take care of patients uh, who required, whom we needed to find out when, when did they take their last medications? Are they hungry? You know, who, what, what time are people dying? Now, this is not too far-fetched about this story because we're just coming across on the other end of another pandemic. And so with these pandemic systems, you need to have data, but the, the, the center of interest is not always about how to use that data or, you know, how to generate the data. It's always centered around the problem that you're trying to solve. And then you're using anything that you can get to try and help you uh, tackle that problem. And so uh, this, this is still a little bit now, this year I've been able to say what I love to do, which is to use data science to generate real life evidence of what we do in medicine. And so I'm fascinated about how you use technology to save lives. And to do this, then I find myself drawn to doing a lot of interdisciplinary work and uh, working with other, others and learning uh, from other people. And so that's my interest. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, to maybe show you and describe some of the biases being observed in some clinical areas, uh, summarize some techniques for evaluating bias in, some, in these clinical systems, and then summarize some of the challenges for operationalizing fair principles in real life. Honestly, this is just going to be machine learning and what, you, what uh, humbles you when it comes to thinking about real life application. And so, you know, in the year 2020, we've observed a pandemic uh, that really brought a lot of stress to our systems. Um, you know, everywhere we are we're now also going through the vaccine distributions are uh, very, very challenging. And so in this last year, uh, we've moved from despair to being hopeful. We've seen an, an increased adoption of technology. And our new normal is that you know, no longer are we using uh, Zoom calls for even patient virtual visits. We have adopted uh, electronic consents. Uh, in the past, I would only get some DocuSign from if you're trying to sign up for a mortgage, uh, but now this is what we send our patients. Uh, we're also shifting care to the home because, per, you know, patients who are afraid to come back to the healthcare system, you know, given the concern of the pandemic, but also that we have this in invasive monitoring and even some of our healthcare systems sends patients at home to be monitored because there was no space in the hospitals. And we've also seen a remarkable progress in science where we've had multiple vaccines uh, developed over the year and now being distributed. But let's talk about some of the patient journeys and what that would mean in terms of thinking about how we apply algorithms and their po potential bias. And so, I'm increasingly, honestly, thinking about fairness in three things. There's the algorithm itself, and this is where some of us will work in. There's the enterprise, so the system, the organization that you work in. And then there's just sort of the larger society or what, for example, a guideline or a principle that you may 
uh, be involved in. So if you are a patient in the last year, and also, honestly, not just the last year, but you know, why not just use this example of COVID uh, just to bring a little stress, even if we're in a much better place. And so you had uh, probably uh, oxygen levels measured. And now that the Apple Watch are saying we can check your oxygen levels, a lot of these wearable devices are saying we can check your oxygen levels. But if you're in the hospital, you had your oxygen level checked in two ways. One is by placing a pulse oximetry, which is just a clip on we place on the finger and it transmits light and tells you how much oxygen is in the level. Now you're very sick and admitted to the ICU, then what we will do is take a direct measurement through your artery, usually at the wrist, and we'll take a small amount of blood and measure how much oxygen is, does your blood have. And it turns out that there's actually a difference for white patients and black patients. And 88 is a very, very important marker because uh, this is the occult of hypoxemia. And that means that at this point in the US, you'll even have uh, the reimbursement of Medicare. They're going to pay for home oxygen. But, you know, if you are above 88, then, you know, you're not eligible even for some of the benefits your insurance can. Now, in this chart, you can see this is the arterial oxygen saturation. This is when you measure with a direct stick to the vessel. And then this is the pulse oximetry, which is the clip on on your finger. We see quite a discrepancy. For example, when your pulse oximetry is around 89, it's pretty much close to 89 for if you're a white patient. But if it's 89 for a black patient, you're close to the 86 mark. So you're already having this hypoxemia, but the measurements that we're using, at least routinely, are not capturing your hypoxemia. Now, in this case, these are the patients who would be sent home uh, to self-monitor, come back if you're more sicker, but what if we missed how sick you are in the first place because of our measurements we are collecting? And so these measurements are not new. One of the other common ones that's used if you've got any imaging or any labs uh, where they're checking your, the function of your kidneys, then what they do calculate is the glomerular filtration rate. And you want it to be above 60, you know, that's a good renal function. But in the past, traditionally, what we've done with the GFR is that we've always, uh, over, you know, uh, overestimated this value. We have a different calibration for black patients. And this is because it's assumed that black patients release more creatinine into their blood at baseline uh, because it's thought we are more muscular and bigger bodied. And so these adjustments can have a big impact because, and as I'll show you this, because maybe you're saying my function is good, but really you're overestimating it and it's really lower. And in this way, you have potential for causing me harm or denying a renal transplant or making me donate a transplant, um, one of my kidneys to someone, yet I'm really on an accelerated path for renal disease. And overall, anyway, Black and Hispanic patients have more uh, occurrence of renal disease. And so this is some other work that we did. And this work specifically, if you are unfortunate to end up in the ICU, then this was the year where people, if you've practiced in the US, I've practiced in both uh, continents, uh, there were not enough beds, ventilators, ICU, you know, ICU beds. And at, at one point, we know that states were looking into the performance of these scoring algorithms to tell us, if I have one bed, am I gonna give it to Judy? or am I going to give it to Judith? And so uh, these scores used in the ICU system, uh, one is the Apache score, another one is called the OASI score, and the SOFA score uh, were increasingly adopted because, first of all, we had some companies start to say, we're going to tell you who's going to go to the ICU, and they build the algorithms on these types of scores. But our work, when we looked, we looked at two public data sets. These are amazing data sets if you're interested in the healthcare space. I encourage you to look at them the EICU database and the MIMIC database, there's a MIMIC 4. And we've repeated the same studies for the MIMIC 4 data set, and even specifically within Emory University, and we find the same patterns existing. Now, in this one, if you look at these curves, these are our C curves, they're all traveling together. It just says, if you have a high Apache score, you're probably pretty, pretty sick. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or anything. Sorry, my dog is misbehaving. And if you have the OASIS score, then you're probably pretty sick. But if you start to look at what they do for every race, then 
we find that there's they, this cause of a predict mortality for has, Hispanics and African Americans compared to the white patients. If you look at where the median points are, and in this specifically for the Oasis code, there's completely no overlap. Now, granted that there is quite a small number of Asians in this data set, but there are these predictions where you're starting to say, if you had one bed and you needed to decide who's gonna get the bed, then you have to look for evidence. And this evidence will end up coming into these scoring systems that we apply in healthcare and decide, you know what, Judith's probably going to die, but Judith is not. I would rather give the bed to Judith if I only have one bed to give. These are things that healthcare providers had to undergo throughout the year. And, you know, one of the other examples, I don't know if you saw it on social media, where this algorithm, I mean, that's a very prestigious institution that has very smart people who work in AI. They came up with this algorithm and, you know, said, you know, maybe if I looked at the age and where this person worked, and their job role, I can prioritize who's going to get vaccines. Um, now, this is not a problem. We have another problem where people do not want to get the vaccine. And, you know, this looked at employee-based variables like age, you know, public health guidance. And the flaw is that the calculation meant hospital administrators and other employees working from home were prioritized before the front of the line residents, because the residents do not stay in one place. You're in the medicine unit for four weeks, then you move to the surgical unit in another week, then you're in the emergency room. And that is not captured in the system. And that may be meant that if I'm an administrator who's always in this one place, that I got bumped up. And this was quite an embarrassment, but showing uh, how difficult it is to translate these algorithms fairly into real life. And then, when uh, when you think about where we collect these data sets, uh, there are some hospitals that already have these markers, for example, a minority serving hospital or, you know, specific type of insurance and or, you know, lower household incomes. Now we start to ingrain and we know there's quite uh, a lot of historical perspectives of where the decisions, how people are redistricting occurs, how urban planning occurs, you know, who gets a fast food restaurant, who gets a much better grocery store close to them, and you know, which hospital is built where, what clinics are built uh, with, a, with, with, you know, with other places, what, what public transport means. And those things matter as you're just saying, gee, I just wanna build an algorithm that builds, you know, works on chest X-rays. Those things turns out they're ingrained in the images that we collect. And this, we are doing some work, uh, we're actually analyzing it. I'm not able to, to show some of the results, but what we're starting to see, even from a chest X-ray, is that you can start to map them to the social deprivation index and start to even see, oh, I'm starting to see this you know, type of conditions grouped across one region, you know, really emphasizing again on the social determinants of health, that are ingrained in the data sets that we collect and use for machine learning. And well, we are lucky to have some data sets, but it turns out that 34 states in the US do not have any data set that is represented in the algorithms. This is a paper uh, that looked at uh, studies between 2015 and 2019 and looked at deep learning algorithms for image-based task, uh, task and benchmark performance, uh, where there was uh, a comparison from physicians across six specialties, including radiology, ophthalmology, dermatology, pathology, gastroenterology, and cardiology. And of the 2,606 studies identified, 72, 74 studies met the inclusion criteria, and 56 of these studies used one or more geographically identifiable US patient cohorts in the training of their algorithm. So if you live in a place like Alabama, you know, Alaska, Georgia, where I live in, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, 34 different states. Your data is not being used to develop any of these algorithms. Yeah, this will make it into the hospital that is taking care of you if you're in the US. Now, when I think of home in, in Kenya, I know that my parents' data is not making it in any of these systems. And yet we know that these systems will be distributed there. And so there's even a bigger call to bring in together uh, more inclusiveness, even geographically. And, you know, so what if you find something that is not working well? We don't know where to publish this. And I hope that we will see some of this encouraged and 
what we notice here is that this is uh, on Twitter, and um, Sam here is pointing out a big flaw in this algorithm. You know, this is an intracranial hemorrhage. It's usually white, just like the skull. And, you know, this is what the algorithm was trying to cut and say, you know what, there's hemorrhage here, but here as a radiologist, I know that this is strict artifact. It's almost like you're trying to shine some light through a metal and the light is distorted. And so it misses the hemorrhage it's supposed to cut and catches the noise that it's not supposed to cut. And in this case, it starts to say, you know what, doc, you cannot revascularize this patient. You cannot save them from their stroke. But this patient has a big bleed with all this white stuff here, and you shouldn't be applying this algorithm here. And you know, luckily the company was able to catch this and say, you know what, you should be using the correct algorithm for what? But we don't think about these things in deployment. And you're, as a physician, we, we have quite a lot of work and busy work to do. And now you have to monitor how you're going to use these algorithms. How will you know when it's not working? And when you know how it's not working, uh, there are no incentives. If you think about the FDA guidelines to immediately stop and say, I'm not going to publish, um, you know, if I make these significant adjustments in my algorithm, I will have to go back and again, start from scratch where I, uh, go back and say, okay, Judy, I, you know, I don't know, uh, I have to go back and uh, get reapproval, which is a lot of money. And so we still need to think about how we incentivize uh, continuous learning and calibration. Now, this is breast cancer. This is uh, computer aided diagnosis. It's not the fancy AI, but we've always used some form of computer aided diagnosis in radiology, specifically for breast cancer screening on mammograms. Now in the UK, uh, they use two readers. So you have one study read and another radiologist reads the study. And then if there's discordance, they come back and uh, debate that and decide what's the correct uh, sort of reading for that study. Now that second reader, I think a lot of companies in Europe are starting to say, we want to make it the AI algorithm. So I would be working with an AI assistant. Now, one thing that has gone down with these curves here is that this is film. We don't see much use of film and we see quite an increased adoption of digital. But what we see, it's not just digital that's adopted, it's digital with computer-aided diagnosis. But when you look at the performance of the uh, AI algorithm is that the solid line is actually a radiologist without computer-aided diagnosis and the dotted line is with CAD use. And you see that the radiologist without CAD actually performs better. So why do we still see this increased rise in the computer a diagnosis for someone who has uh, using CAD, yet it's a lower performance. And what we see here is that there is an incentive. You get $10 more if you use CAD. And so it may be that you build the perfect algorithm. It's deployed perfectly. It has made data from all the parts of the world that you can get it from. You use the correct variables, you're not meeting some people. But if the payers say, I'm going to pay you more for using this system, then people, that's what people are going to do. They're going to use this, that data and that system, and um, even if it doesn't work. And so as we start to see new designs of algorithms, for example, in the US now, they're doing this large vessel occlusion, which has been stroke. They're bypassing the radiologists who've traditionally you know, dictated these studies and interpreted them. And now they're saying, you know what, I'm going to escalate to the interventionalist. And so it's going to be interesting to start to look at outcomes. And even they start to make, um, you know, more and more bold uh, decisions as they are uh, put in the downstream system. So the other thing which I think uh, personally I see as a big threat uh, is this concept where hospitals are using AI to predict the decline of COVID patients. Now, none of this, because it's physician support in the US, the law here is a little loose. And what they say is that, you know, uh, you're using a decision support. The decision is on the final physician. So we don't need FDA approval. And what's that starting to happen is that this is an example of all the 25 models available in the EPIC EMR. And you can start to see these are models that are not validated within, um, you know, not FDA approved uh, because they're decision um, level models. And, you know, if you know better is that uh, sometimes you cannot even understand, or I may not even have the time to figure out, is this really working for my patients uh, that I see? 
And so this, especially for systems that are already in use, is very dangerous because the next time I'll, I'll get an alert. It won't tell me that this is an AI generating this alert. Or if I have a problem with this alert, I don't know whom I'm going to call. And this presents quite a disruptive model that we see uh, working now. So what's the current status? We see, we know that AI are starting to get used in the clinical uh, systems. Uh, we, you know, even if the FDA is, you know, at least in the US saying, this is what we'll, it will take. We know a few months ago, they were saying, we don't need to regulate this space. You know, we don't have a place where we talk and publish about failure. Uh, there's a big danger when we have these upgrades to existing technology track. And as we start to think about um, incentives and uh, money, intellectual property is a big concern. And, um, you know, we still have a very black box nature of especially the modern deep learning approaches. And as I will show you, the explanations or the toolings are made for engineers. They're not made for physicians. And there is a gap because whatever I may think is significant may not have an equivalent a metric to optimize for. And now we see even that there's quite a lot of new things that are coming, complex models. Our team is starting to do this. Uh, we built recently a COVID model using fusion at, um, networks where we merge imaging and we merge uh, clinical data, which even adds more complexity. And we know auto ML, where even the hyperparameters are chosen by a model, is something that we're seeing uh, increasingly. And right now, the incentives are for use are not necessarily sometimes performance. And so what are some of the tools that we have to uh, capture this? Uh, this is sort of when we think about the, the pipeline for models, right? You come up with a research question, hopefully, uh, you come up with your you know, machine learning model, and then you assemble your data. Usually, sometimes this is reversed because you have the data and you say, I have them, I'm going to just use the data to answer that question, I think, should be asked, and that's okay. Um, and then you pre-process. This is a big, big problem as we start to harmonize data sets across multiple fields. You select some of your features, whether it's manually or automatically, you train your model and fine tune and uh, keep repeating uh, this process till you have a good performance on your test data set that um, either is external to your institution or uh, that you split it from your processing pipeline. And then you hopefully have someone who's going to use the algorithm. And so what we see, and we have a, a couple of tools here, is that people have come up with these sort of rules and uh, metrics that you can say, OK, I'm going to calculate this FPR, uh, you know, false negative rate, false omission rate, false discovery rate, and say, this is what is working, and this is what's working for my group. And I'll show you an example of work that we've done in this space. And then as you go along, you're going to say, you know, what do I want to optimize for? And now this starts to be very, very different, you know, difficult. Are you starting trying to be, you know, intervention punitive? Could it hurt individuals? Then you should be using this. Could you help individuals? Then you should maybe be using this, you know? Do you trust the labels? We know that it's very expensive to label medical data. Uh, no, then maybe you should figure out how to use counterfactual uh, fairness. And then when you come back to the top, is you're thinking, am I trying to catch errors or am I trying to make sure that my my data, my model is all inclusive? So you can see that you're always balancing something, right? Even if you're trying to be inclusive, then you don't want to cause harm to some specific groups. And so how you uh, optimize this is still an evolving area. And I think uh, a grand challenge is to come up with a definition of what a practical approach that's not just technocentric that helps us understand what fairness means in medical imaging. And so if you're interested in exploring some of this, um, there are these toolkits. Um, uh, there's one missing here with, from PyTorch called Captain. Uh, I think it's interesting because it has some uh, almost like unpeeling the layers. Uh, I just recently learned about it. And it's something that you can try and use one of the library toolkits to help you figure out and evaluate your model for fairness. 
Um, when we think about, I said you have to choose one. So in this case, what we use is a very common uh, data set from the MIMIC, uh, their chest X-rays. Uh, usually most data sets uh, use these 14 labels that were inspired by the NIH, very controversial. And we view at zero, there's no bias. Everything is good. But if you are in the um, positive, then you're favored. And so you can see the size of the bubble here, it shows that this is a larger group in the population compared to maybe the size of these two bubbles, the black and other or the Hispanics. And so you can see this in this data set, quite a large number of white patients are represented. And most of them are either at zero or in the positive. And if you look at the minority populations, they're usually below uh, the zero mark. And in this case, for example, for pneumonia, you know, uh, or when you have an effusion, then the algorithms perform well for, black, uh, for white patients uh, very poorly for the Hispanic patients. And if you have cardiomegaly, it's flip. It's zero, close to zero for the minorities, but very poorly for the uh, white patient. And so if you imagine, you don't have a narrow task always in medicine. You're always trying to say, hey, I need to figure out what's going to be my, um, my prediction. And in that case, you want to make sure that how do you, it's one algorithm. How are you going to make sure that, you know what, I don't want to have cardiomegaly poorly performing for white patients, but I want to make sure that other uh, markers that will perform better, like the pneumothorax, re retain their su superior performance, but make sure that I'm pulling up everyone else and also for the other races. And what was interesting here is that here in uh, Emory, we have a very, very diverse data set because in, in Atlanta, we have almost an equal ratio. We don't have a lot of Asians, but we almost have an equal ratio of, um, of, of whites and blacks, in, at least in the population data sets that we have. And when we repeated this study, what was surprising is that we found the same uh, patterns of bias persisted. Well, in the past, I'd have said, what you need is to accumulate more data sets, make sure that you're having more black patients. It turns out that that's not enough and we need to, we're currently exploring this. And actually, uh, I think yesterday there was a new paper that came up and said, you know what? The algorithms can tell you the age and the race of the patient, and we're starting to figure out what does this unmasking and, and you know evaluating bias looks like. And so in this case, it's not just enough to do the TPR because I don't know why the algorithm is predicting well for some populations and not others. And it turns out that just by increasing the data set, it's not enough. And maybe some of the things that we may have better things with performance is as we start to make sure that the distribution of disease in the uh, population during use during training is the same as the application in future and we may have some gaps so in summary this paper they found that if you were between zero to 20 years or black and were on medicaid the algorithms performs very poorly for you and so uh, now i've shown you sort of the ratios I've shown you a practical example that is using the ratios, but how do we know what the algorithm is looking at? This truly is an area that needs a lot of work. Saliency maps, these are chest x-rays. Um, usually we'll find some you know, saliency map. We know they vary a lot. They're very poorly performing. Uh, every paper wants them included in their paper, but they do not make sense for a radiologist. Uh, and then also look at these two things, at telectasis and cardiomegaly, different labels, and I would also say that this heart is big, so there is cardiomegaly. And, you know, just showing me that the model is thinking here and the fusion that the model is looking up when usually clinically, I would see it more in the lung bases, are very confusing. And so what we still need is better explain explainability tools that are not just geared to the engineering teams, but also to physicians that allow us to utilize some of our clinical acumen to come back and say, oh, I know what this is, I'm going to, um, this is how I'm going to fix it. And so uh, this is now, uh, you know, published and uh, I'm super happy to report that there was quite some good reception about this paper that we did. And what we found was that uh, when we think about the guidelines that are currently in use, we, most of the time, 
uh, fairness is discussed like maybe in the supplementary material. Sometimes it's not mentioned. You know, it's not, there's no guideline. They tell you, you should be sharing your data. You should report this and or something else. But it doesn't tell you how to evaluate for fairness. And so we still need a lot of guidance. And I believe that if we can start to bring consensus, and it's not going to come from one person. It really requires a lot of expertise and many people to weigh in that we can get to one point where we can define and even uh, put uh, improve our guidelines. And so how are some people are uh, using AI? I know I've been a Debbie Downer uh, saying, you know, AI sucks. Uh, we, the metrics, the data, we, you know, systems are terrible. And when we use them to make these predictions, we can have potential for harm. Uh, we, the tooling that we have to explore these harms is also terrible. So uh, is there any, light at the end of the tunnel. I want to focus on some of this work that actually we're extending here. Ziad is a very interesting researcher. I, I really encourage you to read his work. And what they did is that uh, in osteoarthritis, which just means that your bones, the joints in your knees, uh, specifically, they were looking at this using the NIH osteoarthritis data set, uh, narrows very much and you get a lot of pain, you're not moving. And usually some patients will get a uh, knee replacement, you know, very common uh, procedure done. And so, uh, but the score that is used here is called, called the kelgren lawrence uh, grading system, KLG. And this KLG uh, was actually evaluated on white, uh, a white European population. And so when you apply it and you start to, in, you know, mix it and see its performance in your uh, um, races, well, we noticed that it's very poorly performing for, uh, you know, uh, black and blacks and Hispanics, people with no uh, education and income, and also, um, yeah, and 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 low low education and income. And so, what they did uh, this team is that they came up with an algorithmic severity, and they did one thing better, which is to say, what if we listen to the patients? What if you said? When Judy says she really has a pain of nine, now we know that pain is quite a big, big area for research, uh, especially with the opioid crisis going on in the US. Um, and they say, you know, the algorithm started to see things that were not even obvious to me as a radiologist, and it started to account for structural issues that could explain the disparities in pain. Now you can imagine if you could figure out this and help patients uh, because you're using a more objective measure. This is only possible with an algorithm. And the work now that we're doing is to conduct a reader study to first of all validate on a new data set, prepare a data set for the community to use. And number three is to validate and see what if we conducted a reader study to figure out uh, what do radiologists see now with the help of the algorithm? Hopefully we'll have some better tools than saliency maps, but this is an interesting area of showing how algorithms can even help us be uh, have superhuman performance. And so uh, we see quite interesting work now that is coming up that it's saying, hey, why don't we listen to the patient? You know, and so this is not even an AI system, but if you just listen to the system, to the patients and incorporate their pain, uh, we're starting to see that people, the radiologist performance is even improving. And so it's going to be interesting to think about the ground truth and how we acquire that and how we can objectively uh, standardize that and how we use algorithms to generate new metrics. Uh, this is an example of another a paper done by the same team and here they looked at an algorithm. Essentially what this algorithm does, it's already in use, is that it says, you know, Judy, you're pretty sick. We should get you more resources to make sure you don't come back to hospitals. Because it turns out uh, when you're in the hospital, you spend a lot of money. Uh, but if you, you know, if, if, but you have to be able to identify who are those patients that you need to uh, refer to additional care. Now, if you look at the patterns of care, which is why I was showing you those minority hospitals, is that they're not very good at figuring out, oh, you know what? I need to be able to go, uh, you know, to their primary care. So black patients do not really use primary care doc. They have high ER costs, emergency room costs, but not primary care. So if you use um, health cost as a metric for your algorithm, what you do is you divert care. And what they notice that even if this algorithm did not have race included, by using a marker 
that's tied to health-seeking behavior, they found that they were referring black patients who were more sicker and at a later time. And by just coming up with another proxy that combined health prediction with cost prediction, this approach reduced the excess number of excessive active chronic conditions in blacks and with an 84% reduction in the bias. I talked about the glomerular filtration rate. So what are people doing about this? The, you know, this use of race in medical research is quite an interesting area for debate. Some people have said, you know, maybe because race is such a marker for where you come from, uh, maybe we should just use that to give us a proxy for demographic um, social determinants for health. And other people say, you know, we should completely remove it. We know that there's a signal, and maybe it's true that they, we believe we may not have a good explanation for it right now, why some values differ. And now for the pulse oximetry, it's because of the way they work, they require light. So if you have a nail polish, and if you have darker skin, that may be difficult. And, and so what it's almost like these two groups that say, um, we're trying to either eliminate use of race in algorithms, but we've seen that that's not enough, or maybe try to use that. And uh, maybe ultimately what's going to have is a bit of both, but we use a, clin you know, a clinical and social consequences to figure out what to do with them. And um, so some of the stuff they have shown is that when they derase the algorithm with the GFR, you know, just by removing race, some, uh, you know, there's there's nothing statistically significant, but here, even if you're catching one more one more patient in a group that's already marginalized, I think this is super important. So you can see that some people get a recalibration of the chronic kidney decision. So that means they get more uh, therapy, more options for them to support, for example, kidney education, uh, who becomes eligible for the transplant waiting list, and even an early referral to the nephrologist by removing grace. And so, one example that I like to do is, and I recently did this, uh, I, I got these questions from uh, Kevin and Abebe, and what they do is that they ask, and, and, and honestly, it would be interesting if you're an educator here or a developer to try and do, answer these questions. You know, Would you uh, either be happy to do it, reluctant, object, but do it if you have to, or resign and do nothing, or resign your job and do a public protest campaign. If you had to implement a GPS system uh, to track political dissidents, you know that this actually all these systems are in place. We know that there's a lot of this that was done during Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations. Um, you know that we know that uh, as we've gone through COVID, uh, there has been the use of facial recognition. And then we know that there's a lot of unionization and people have built uh, this unionization score. And it's very interesting to talk about it. I think one of the examples here is, um, could you design a machine learning system that calculates and assigns credit scores for a bank, which optimizes profit, but is likely to deny, deny loans to the point? This was probably my, my widest uh, you know, answer. And some of my students say they'll be quite happy to do it. Others, you know, really nothing was bad here because they were like, well, they're helping the poor now to get more in debt. But if you don't give the poor people money, then they're not going to be able to get out of the cycle. And so it's an interesting task that I like to think about. Now, wrapping up here, uh, you know, fairness will always have tension uh, because people will always say, how about trust, you know, versus being fair? You know, how, what are, the, where is the calibration? How much explainability do you need to have this fairness? Uh, how much generalizability, which is application and success of a machine learning algorithm when applied to a new population? And maybe by trying to achieve fairness, my performance will decrease. And we all have to figure out what's a good metric for that. And so I think the grand challenge is that there's a tremendous opportunity to use machine learning to develop metrics uh, for example, the examples I showed for the pain score that actually narrow the disparities. Uh, we have to think about uh, human-machine interaction, human factors engineering as a step uh, to make sure that when we deploy these systems in the enterprise, that they actually work and they fit within the uh, uh, workflow systems. We have to think about incentives and how to change the regulatory framework. We have to invest a lot in data science in terms of curation, collection, thinking of ground truths, and an evolution in machine learning methods, especially around explainability and the DevOps pipeline. This conference has had quite a lot of 
talks about thinking about optimizing the devil and the role of simulation to try and anticipate and see where machine learning fails. And so this is how I think about this. And I hope some of you will be interested in this. Uh, we need to think about standards. We need to collect data on vulnerable groups and uh, look at the intersection of population and establish thresholds um, and maximum disparities for groups. And we have to be transparent in the definitions of fairness that we use and be intentional in evaluating disparate treatment and disparate impact uh, in clinical trials for machine learning in medicine. And we have to commit to post-marketing surveillance or almost provide um, uh, incentives for figuring out the real world evidence and impact of machine learning in health models. If you're interested in this space, please uh, consider submitting uh, 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 paper or your experience or toolings uh, that help us uh, move this field a little forward. It's an early field. We need to work on this a lot. Uh, I'd like to just give a special shout out to my team here at Emory. We love students from all over the world and have an interdisciplinary team. We're always growing our team. And these are ways to get a hold of me. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my thoughts.